This session is Evasion of High-End IDPS Devices in the Age of IPv6, and your speakers are Antonius Alassis and Enno Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Good morning, everybody. Good to see so many people as uh, IPv6 is still considered in some hats as a niche thing, which from our perspective it isn't, and I'm glad to see so many people for our talk on evasion of high-end uh, IDPS devices by means of playing with IPv6. My name is Enno, this is Antonius. We both have a long history in protocol and device research, and we both have a strong affinity to IPv6, which uh, then those two things uh, give an interesting combination. Uh, looking with the eyes of a security researcher at this bloated thing called IPv6 might produce interesting results, which we are going to discuss in this talk, which is split into three main pieces. There is first uh, like an introductory problem statement of uh, some elements of the IPv6 protocol specification which can lead to security problems. After that, we'll discuss some resource results in practice, and obviously we'll derive some conclusions and provide some mitigation advice. Uh, IPv6 is important. It's uh, growing steadily in uh, Germany, where I come from. Uh, we have right now about 10% uh, IPv6 deployment on broadband subscribers, so we have a higher rate when it comes to content and transit. Uh, so it's there. Uh, it's eminent. It will touch all of our lives in the next few years. There will be the Internet of Things, which even adds more momentum to IPv6. And uh, looking at IPv6, looking at the way how an IPv6 datagram is composed, it turns out that uh, to some degree, it looks like uh, this nice uh, German train. There is a main element driving the whole thing, and after this main element, uh, in a chained way, there is more elements, which gives an exact uh, description of how an IPv6 packet might look like. The main difference here to IPv4 is that in IPv6, there is the concept of so-called extension headers. Next to the what is called, or what we call, the main header of an IPv6 datagram. Additional headers can be added to serve different specific purposes, to specify a routing path, to transport information, which is either intended to be processed by uh, all nodes on the traffic path or just a destination node. There might be uh, security information in those headers uh, for IPsec purposes. So after the main header, there is the option, they don't have to be used, but uh, there is the option of using so-called extension headers. And uh, these extension headers actually looking closer and looking closer at the RFC specifying those, which is the RFC 2460, which is a bloated document of uh, like 40, 50 pages with, if, uh, with even pseudocode in it uh, describing how certain packets could be built. And once uh, those are built, they have to be processed and passed. Uh, these extension headers are the source of three main problems. The first one is, when it comes to extension headers, there's a high degree, say, of flexibility, and things can vary. Uh, there might be variable types of extension headers. There might be, uh, they might have variable sizes. They might occur in a variable order. The, that main RFC, which I mentioned, specifies a recommended order, but that is uh, just a recommendation. And uh, for one specific header, the so-called uh, hop-by-hop header, HPH, um, that one has to follow the main header. And uh, there is for more headers, like the routing header or the first uh, so-called destination header, there is uh, specifications where they have to occur, but there might be more of those. Uh, there is even a second variant of that thing that I call a destination header, which we are going to see in practice in, a, in some minutes. So the order is not strictly specified, which is even, say, uh, increased as for the security impact, uh, given they can occur multiple times within a packet. And uh, they might contain variable fields, type length value fields, and those of you uh, who have uh, some knowledge, say, in protocol security, 
uh, you know that uh, type length value fields uh, from a se security perspective uh, sometimes uh, say smell a bit. So there is a high degree of um, how many, how big, which order, and what they contain, uh, which in the end of the day means an IPv6 packet can somewhat be uh, looked at as a function uh, of several input variables. Second, fragmentation might occur. Uh, in general, in the IPv6 world, fragmentation is not supposed to happen. But not being supposed to happen doesn't mean uh, it cannot, ex cannot exist. And IPv6 goes back to the 90s, where there was a strong belief in what is called the Postal's Principle. Be conservative in what you send, but be liberal in what you accept. Uh, this is the mindset uh, that has uh, formed IPv6, which means, um, say, it's open for fragmentation. It's not supposed to be there, but still all stacks uh, are expected to, to cope with a fragmented packet once they occur. And again, that um, main ROC specifies once fragmentation occurs, there is two main parts of uh, the datagram to be fragmented. That is uh, first the so-called unfragmentable part, which uh, carries um, the main header and the, uh, uh, the next... Um, uh, following ones, uh, those which are meant to be processed by all nodes on the traffic path, and the rest of the fragment, which can be composed of the upper layer payload, say the TCP payload or UDP payload, and uh, potentially additional extension headers, this uh, thing can be fragmented. So in addition to that variable size, order occurrences, these things can even be uh, split into several fragments. Uh, this adds uh, to the, uh, say, problem space. Okay. Now let's uh, get another problem. It is regarding how this IPv6 accession headers are chained together. Uh, each accession header has its own, let's say, protocol value. It serves the same purpose it was, as it was the case in IPv4. And each accession header uh, has a field the so-called next header value field, which points to the next accession header. So, for example, the value of the destination options header is 60. So, uh, the routing accession header in our example uh, has a field, an next header value field, uh, whose value is 60, which points to the next one. It's like uh, a list of pointers. Each pointer points to the next accession header. This seems quite simple, and it doesn't cause any problems until we reach, again, fragmentation. Now, let's assume that we have the fragmentable part displayed at the top of the figure. Uh, this, is, this consists of the destination options header plus the TCP header and the payload. And this one has to be fragmented in our scenario. So fragment one uh, will consist of the IPv6 main header plus the routing header plus the fragment accession header which is added because now the fragmentation fields are not included in the, in the main header as it used to be in IPv4. And then we have the two fragmentable parts. The fragment accession header is going to point to the next headers. If I'm going to ask you, for example, the first fragment, uh, what is going to be the next header value of the IPv6 fragment header? This one over here. taking into account that uh, the value of the destination options header is 60. Uh, I suppose that we are going to answer that uh, this value will be 60. Now, regarding the second one, uh, the second fragment carries the TCP header plus its payload. So if I'm going to ask you what is going to be here and taking into account that the TCP protocol value is 6, what are you going to ask to, to, to respond now? What will be the value here? In this one, the second fragment. If you are going to say six, because the next header is TCP, it will be wrong. It should be 60 again. It should point again to the destination of header. It should point again to the first fragment, to the first accession header of the fragmentable part. Actually, the recipient should ignore any next header values except from the first one, from the very first one. This is yet another gray area. 
another gray area that you can play with it in order to cause security issues. So um, for those of you familiar with the LangSec initiative, you might suddenly note uh, that uh, LangSec mindset wasn't present when all this was specified. For those of you who are not, it might make sense to go to www.langsec.org. That said, uh, let's summarize for the moment um, that we have a certain mess here uh, with a high degree of variance of different parts of the IPv6 packet. And all these, uh, say, different parts uh, with their variable size or their occurrences and so on uh, might even be combined in different ways, in different order, with uh, changing uh, header fields pointing to the next ones. Um, and you might already sense uh, this can be the cause for problems. We have a fundamental problem actually here. There's a high degree of flexibility and freedom, which in general is a good thing in life. In general, that's a good thing uh, in the internet and uh, in communication. Uh, still, for security, a high degree of um, flexibility and freedom might, be, uh, uh, might come into the way how security enforcement um, is, uh, is happening today. As um, one might ask, what could possibly go wrong? And thinking about how security enforcement happens today, looking at, say, firewalls or IDPS devices, security enforcement relies on, network security enforcement often relies on, like, identifying certain elements or properties of a packet, say, for a stateful firewall, identifying, okay, which part is used, what are the flags of this packet, what, are, what is the sequence number. For IDPS devices, identify signatures and then act upon this identified properties. Now, if there was a high degree of flexibility and freedom, this make, might make this uh, type of identification, which uh, might even happen in, in uh, say, specialized hardware like FPGAs looking at certain offsets. All these types of devices looking for fixed properties and trying to enforce security based on what they see uh, might, uh, say, have problems with that high degree of flexibility and um, uh, freedom. And this is exactly what was the main... A question of our research, what happens if we, uh, say, compose packets built upon variations and uh, flexible content of these exact fields that we have described? Okay, and now if you believe that uh, all this is uh, just a theory, uh, if you think so, uh, I'm afraid that uh, you are wrong. Uh, there is a tool out there, uh, it's called Chiron. Uh, I have written this tool in order to allow you to build more or less uh, any kind of IPv6 uh, chain you want. You can combine the JSON headers in many ways. You can vary the order, the number of occurrences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all the things that we discussed up to now. And uh, we use the tools, this tool, for different purposes. First of all, for security assessment to test. Uh, devices like uh, IDPS devices. And secondly, when you find an issue, uh, when you find a technique to evade, for example, an IDPS device, there is also a module there, a layer 3 proxy, which allows you to uh, use this specific technique in order to evade a device uh, by launching any type of attack, actually, from uh, simple port scanning to SQL rejection, from layer 4 to layer 7, actually. Uh, this tool is going to be uh, renewed uh, and will be published in your version uh, very shortly. But uh, let's show you for the time being uh, what are the results. Okay. Um, we're going to describe several different cases. We have tested several IDPS devices, both open source and uh, commercial ones. Uh, due to time constraints, we're going to show you just some results. Uh, first of all, let's talk about Suricata. Suricata is an open source IDPS supported by the Homeland Security. Um, first, you tested the, the version 2.0.1. It was the previous one. Um, it was the latest one until June, actually. And we found out that by adding just an IPv6 destination options header, uh, which was a little bit long, let's say it was part by six or more octets of bytes, and by fragmenting this uh, chain in uh, seven or more fragments, uh, uh, Suricata could 
could be evaded uh, as long as these fragments were sent misordered. Uh, I'm going to show you a war circuit output here, how these packets look like. Uh, this is a technique that I used to evade the previous version of Suricata. If you can observe the offsets here, you can see that first we send the last fragment with offset equals to nine, then offset equals to one, and so on, so on. So it was just this combination of accession headers, fragmentation, and m order fragments that uh, enable us to evade Suricata. Thankfully, uh, the guys, uh, the developers, reacted really fast. Uh, they had patched this in just a few days and released a newer version, 2.0.2. But it seems that uh, there is such a mess out there regarding the implementation of 5 6 on headers that even this version uh, can also be evaded. Yep. So, uh, thanks to the developers, it was fixed very quickly. But now we're going to show you in a live demo uh, how you can evade even the latest version. I have two consoles here. In the one console I have an output uh, of Suricata alerts. I have a Wireshark output here. Okay. At first, I'm going to uh, trigger an alert on purpose to see that everything works fine. Uh, Suricata is not placed in line, so it's not going to block any traffic, but it's going to trigger an alert. Uh, we have implemented a rule here that detects any traffic, any TCP traffic pointed to TCP port 80. So any traffic that it is potentially HTTP traffic. So by setting this traffic, I can see, you can see here the right console that there is an alert uh, which says test www activity. And of course, you can see in the Wireshark output the same packet that I sent, this one. And below this, a reset tag packet from my target because it is a reset tag because I don't run actually a web server, but it is a demonstration that uh, the packet passes through and I uh, have a response back, but an alert is triggered, as you can see here. It just happened that Suricata is not in line. Now I'm going to send a similar packet, but uh, this time by manipulating a little bit uh, the IPv6 chain. You can see again that I, I have sent the same packet. I have received, I have received a reset packet from my target, which means that the packet reached the target and it triggered the response, but there is no alert here. So Suricata could be evaded. Uh, we have reported uh, this issue to the Suricata developers. It has been fixed. Uh, it is available in the uh, GitHub repository, and they're going to release uh, a newer version officially either this Friday or on Monday the latest. Now let's go to a commercial device, uh, a high-end commercial device, the well-known HP tipping point. Uh, it was in February of uh, 2014 that we found the issue, the first issue. The issue is displayed in the figure. Uh, if you recall, the next header values that we discussed at the beginning of the presentation, uh, in our example, as we explained, it should be 60 and 60. If you send a 60 and 6, as it is here, 60 and 6, just two simple fragments with just a destination of header, we found out that tipping point can, could be evaded. Uh, again, we reported the issue to the tipping point and uh, they fixed it in March. And they released officially the patch uh, about a month later. So uh, this issue was resolved. The problem is that, as you said, there is quite a mess regarding accession headers. So there is yet another way to evade the latest version of tipping point again. So we have a, a, a tipping point device, a, a mid-size enterprise device, S110, uh, sitting here. Uh, it's configured in a certain way, um, uh, which is not of relevance for, for the demo. Just uh, know that every no HTTP traffic uh, should be able to get through the device. 
which we will uh, have a look at. Um, we will again, uh, Antonius will send some packets. Uh, I have a, a Wireshark running here. Uh, we, we, we will see what uh, gets through um, to, uh, uh, to my laptop, which would be the, uh, the victim. Uh, say a web server which has to be attacked by, by whatever kind of SQL injection XXS, so uh, whatever uh, which is going to be protected um, uh, by this one. Uh, first, uh, once okay. uh, Antonio uh, sends a certain packet. Yeah, I sent just a simple TCP SYN packet to port 80. As you can see from my Warsark output, I can do it again very quickly. And uh, we will see that uh, there, is no, uh, there is no packet received. We, we see the, the that target. we don't see anything, uh, so apparently, um, I mean, you have to trust us so the device is set up correctly, it is. Um, nothing gets through, so expected behavior. But once okay. uh, the packet is again modified in a certain I'm going to way. manipulate it a little bit. I have cleared the wire shark. We're sending it again. And you can see that uh, now uh, I receive a reset tag for my target. So the packet apparently gets through. I mean, there's a the, the reset send as there's no web server running, but for the purpose of this demo, um, uh, this is irrelevant. Uh, suffice to note and to say the packet gets through uh, just by a certain combination of, uh, as you can see here, it's uh, fragmented and uh, taking a quick closer look, it turns out there was a certain combination of a fragmentation header and destination header, and this uh, is sufficient uh, to fly under the radar. And we could get, uh, by adding, uh, say, these types of headers, uh, we could um, get any packet, any type of attack packet to fly under the radar of tipping point um, a device uh, running latest code as of today. Uh, again, we reported this to a, a tipping point like 10 weeks ago. Uh, they got back to us, uh, they, uh, they were working on it, uh, they have a, a fix available, they have a patch available, it will be released, um, uh, say, in the second half of August. Uh, so today it's not yet um, released, that's why we didn't discuss the details in very much uh, detail. But given the documentation of our work is, is around, uh, it's like uh, RTFD, and you smart guys might be able to figure out on your own what, uh, what we just did and what happened. That said, let's uh, discuss mitigation approaches. Those can be split into three areas. First of all, in the ITF world, um, say RFC 24, uh, 60 is not an example of, uh, of an RFC providing good guidance and clear guidance. It doesn't even use the uh, RFC notation with uh, words and capitals. So uh, there is um, too few guidance and strictness uh, from the standards themselves. Uh, then uh, our impression is that vendors um, could improve their quality assurance um, efforts, especially when it comes to devices like this one. Uh, we have tested, by the way, um, some source fire stuff as well, but um, we have not included this for time reasons. Uh, there are issues in that space uh, um, as well. Wait for our blog upcoming blog posts um, for the topic. So quality assurance on the Windows side. For you guys uh, from enterprise organizations or from organizations acting as users kind of of these devices, uh, be aware there is a, a whole mess when it comes to extension headers and fragmentations causing security problems. So drop those extension headers which you don't need at your network boundaries, which right now are all of them. There is no production use of any extension headers going through network boundaries. Drop them. Uh, which is, by the way, what many uh, large organizations already do. Uh, that said, so that's another takeaway we would like to provide. Uh, that is, um, IPv6 is a huge, complex thing. There's lots of research areas. Uh, so if you want to uh, be here in, in, in one year, looking at IPv6 might be a good idea. And um, for you, all of you will face IPv6 in the, in the near future, so do your homework, read the specs, build a lab, play with the stuff, and get familiar with IPv6, as otherwise uh, you might be uh, exposed. Thanks for listening.
so we have like three to five minutes uh, for Q&A. Um, we will around uh, for the whole conference uh, anyway, so feel free to approach us uh, at any point uh, to discuss stuff. No questions? This might be a good sign or not. Uh, in, in any case, uh, another 10 seconds to give you the opportunity. Enjoy Black Hat. Have fun. Thank you. Yeah.